This is lecture three. <clears throat> We're looking at types of interest groups. And um, when we look at the interest group system, there's, of course, if we, if we look back at, uh, at what we've already um, covered, uh, just cover it quickly one more time. You know, this is all about the principle of association. And it's no more um, evident than any, anywhere else than in the United States. And uh, this is an observation that was uh, first put together by Alexis de Tocqueville in the 1830s. Very few nations are like the United States, where we have separate economic, ethnic, religious, social, and geographical interests. And we also are a federal government, so we have uh, national, state, and local entities. And we have separation of powers in the Constitution. <coughs> and so therefore, there are numerous points of, of access for interest groups at the local, state, and national levels. Now, we also know that for any, uh, any success that an interest group has, it's directly related to its ability to organize effectively. So we'll look at these uh, economic groups um, and they're not just economic groups. We'll look at um, a traditional, non-traditional, single issue, public interest, ideological, and government. What we won't look at are PACs. We'll look at that separately, and that'll probably be the last lecture for interest groups. <coughs> um, now, again, um, groups have to organize effectively. And those that have organized on the basis of, of improving their economic activity uh, or the economy is their focus are, um, are probably more effectively organized than any other group. <clears throat> so in order to uh, not only maintain but further uh, their position uh, in the economy, these um, these interest groups that are based on economic principles or economic interests um, engage in political activity uh, because they want to seek favorable policies from the government. And we'll refer back to the uh, the Iron Triangle at this point. This is this is how interest groups work. And, the, and when we're talking about the government, we're talking about um, their interaction with both the uh, executive branch through the agencies and the legislative branch through uh, congressional committees. <clears throat> now, the types of the types of economic groups are uh, agriculture, labor, uh, business, and professional. And we'll look at each of these as we uh, move through the <coughs> through the, uh, the list. Now, economic groups, because of their uh, financial largesse. Uh, have an organizational edge. And the abundance of um, money leads to an abundance of groups. So this is the largest section. About 50% 50, 50 of all uh, interest groups um, are uh, business related. Now corporations use money <clears throat> for uh, from goods and services produced and sold. Uh, to help fund interest groups. And these economic groups offer members a powerful incentive for membership because most of these uh, groups are involved in the production of private or what we call individual goods. And that means that, that these goods benefit a group that can grant uh, them directly to individual members. So for instance, the uh, Dairy Association, the American Dairy Association, lobbies on behalf of its members, which of course are dairy producers. And if um, dairy producers can get a better uh, subsidy for their milk, then that is a, a grant directly to an individual member because the government is guaranteeing them a, uh, a price level that, um, that, is, that is independent of, of market needs. It, it has no relationship to supply and demand. They, the government just says each uh, each dairy farmer will get. Uh, we guarantee them that 
that they will get two dollars and fifty cents a gallon for milk, <laughs> and consequently, um, <clears throat> refineries, milk or milk producers, um, then give them over to those who put it into uh, cartons and pasteurize it and sell it to you. Um, they have to make their profit. So many times, despite the fact that the amount of milk that we're drinking is down, the price that we pay for it is up because these groups have effectively organized and convinced the government that um, it's economically beneficial for them to receive um, a subsidy so that they can stay in business, but it also results in higher prices for consumers. <coughs> and so these economic groups are organized highly organized because they serve the economic needs of their potential members and sometimes those economic needs are much greater than the numbers of the members themselves so let's look at the type of interest groups that we have first there's business groups and these business groups are um, are ones in which the goal is to promote economic interests of its members and <clears throat> these business groups like the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the National Association of Manufacturers, the Business Roundtable, um, are at least half of all the formally registered uh, lobbies um, that are required by law. And of course, they concentrate on business interests. And <clears throat> there's a size factor advantage that they have. Um, of course, small groups are more cohesive, so they're likely to recognize the, the significance of the individual contributions of their uh, of their members and they try to reward that that effort so the Chamber of Commerce the National Association of Manufacturers the Business Roundtable um, represent represent the businesses that many of your parents work work for and they fund those uh, interest groups because those interest groups look out for them uh, in Washington they they protect them uh, from foreign competition and they also try to drum up business from the billions and billions and billions of dollars that government spends on a on a yearly basis now the second are labor groups and labor groups promote policies that benefit workers and uh, it, it workers in general and union members in particular the problem for unions though is that union membership except in the public sector in the public, by the public sector, we, we mean anybody who works for a government um, entity, teachers, uh, trash, trash collectors, um, all those in most cases are, are, public, uh, are public servants. And so therefore, <clears throat> they are represented by public unions. In the private sector, the, number, uh, the numbers of Americans who belong to unions has, has vastly declined in the last... Uh, 50 years. Now, the dominant organization in the labor groups uh, is the AFL CIO, which is the American Federation of Labor and the Committee of Industrial Organizations. Um, where the growth has occurred in the private sector in the last decade has been in the service, in the service sector, and that's where you see um, growth in in unions like uh, the service employees. Uh, international Union. Um, they represent both skilled and unskilled labor. Uh, in addition to the uh, AFL-CIO, there are the indep big independent unions. The UAW is the United Auto Workers. The Teamsters are those who are unionized and drive uh, uh, trucks. They move goods uh, in, uh, in, in a number of venues. Um, but that's the second, the second type of group. The third type is agricultural, and agricultural is um, just based on their numbers. Of course, they're going to be small. Remember, in 1896, we went from being a rural country majority to an urban country majority, and that that gulf between those two um, those two segments of American society has continued to grow wider and wider and uh, wider and wider apart, so that. I believe the uh, the number of Americans who are engaged in agriculture is um, it's it's less than two percent, and of course that has been aided and abetted by the fact that farms have grown far larger 
uh, than they were um, you know, 50 or, or 100 years ago. Um, now the, uh, the Grange and the American Farm Bureau Federation, these came about because of the way, in the, especially in the 19th century, and this is really in, a, in, refer, in reference to the Grange, um, they represented the individual farmer. And the indiv individual farmer felt put upon by both government and entities like the railroad. Um, railroads because of transportation, and the government uh, because of the, of the need for silver or paper money. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it, please ignore that. Uh, look at I forgot to get rid of it. The the uh, thing in purple, the statement in purple, that's from unions. Please don't write that down. <laughs> um, but again, these agricultural groups do. Um, do represent um, small but powerful clientele, the American Dairy Association, the American, um, the American beef uh, producers, um, small in number, but rather large in, uh, in influence in Washington. <laughs> then we get the professional groups. And most professionals have some sort of lobbying association, doctors, nurses, uh, um, uh, attorneys, and the most powerful is the one that doctors have, uh, have developed, and that's the AMA, the American Medical Association. But also very f influential is the American Bar Association for these professional groups. <clears throat> um, not a lot you can say about them, but obviously because they're highly paid professionals, they're able to spend, these organizations are able to spend quite a bit of money in Washington. Now, non-economic groups, are drawn together by what we call purposive incentives. And this is the, uh, by definition, it's an opportunity to promote a cause in which the uh, members believe is important. But unlike the private or individual um, goods with, that which are provided by the, by the economic groups, most non-economic groups offer what's, what's known as collective goods or public goods. And those, um, are supposed to suffice as an incentive for membership. Now, the other problem is for um, for uh, citizens' interest groups is that the benefits are shared by all, so they can't be allotted on an individual basis, and that leads, of course, to our to the free rider problem. Now, we've discussed this in one of the earlier lectures, but I'm going to go over it again. So, the free rider problem deals with what we call collective goods. And an individual can receive the good even when he or she doesn't contribute to the group effort. And so consequently, the incentive to join the group and the promote and the promotion of its cause is reduced. And consequently, organizations have to lure membership by trying to create individual benefits, such as magazines, coffee cups, t-shirts, etc. And also to perhaps um, bring them together in uh, the social arena um, so that they can meet people, uh, they can meet each other face to face. And what has also helped, of course, is the, the web, which has transformed most things since 1992 when it became, when it began to be used widespread. Um, but what we have to do, what we do have to say is the economic groups still have an organized advantage over citizens groups. And the, the difference in this is, for the economic groups, it's their livelihood. They're trying to protect that. If their livelihood goes away, they have to start from scratch, or they're destitute or whatever. With citizens groups, it's something uh, more about passion uh, for trying to, rent, to, to provide a remedy for a cause. So let's look at the types of interest groups that uh, we have. First and foremost is what we call public interest groups. And they uh, attempt to act in the broad interests of society. So you see there, the League of Women's Voters, Common Cause, the Sierra Club, which is about conservation. Common Cause is about public policy. League of Women's Voters is about uh, the integrity of the political process. And they seek benefits which are less tangible, which means we just can't grab onto them, but are, are broadly shared. We want clean elections. 
we want better political candidates, and that's what why those are. And we want you know clean air and water, which is why the Sierra Club is involved. Um, so uh, this is very much a tra these are very much traditional public interest groups that might be a little bit on the way. You, you don't. Uh, with League of Women Voters uh, will sponsor the debates of political candidates. Um, but you hear less about the League of Women Voters, you hear less about Common Cause, you even hear less about the Sierra Club, because in all three arenas, there are new actors on, on the stage. Now for um, what we call non-traditional protest groups, these are the type of uh, groups that protest uh, the status of its members, and they try to convince the government to take some sort of remedial action. So a really good example of that would be the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored Persons, NOW, which is the National Organization of Women, MALDEF, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, um, ACT UP. Uh, there's, there's a number of, of non-traditional groups that work toward furthering the interests of their members. And it's usually in more of a how they're treated in society or how they're treated by government. Then we have one of the, 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 the biggest, most powerful groups now, and these are single issue groups. They're organized to influence policy in basically one area. But the, pro the problem is these groups are very polarizing because they don't want to um, compromise at all uh, on, the, on the issues that they're interested in. So pro, you've got pro-choice versus pro-life. Um, you do have you do have various uh, where the Sierra Club is a is is a public interest group. It can also it can also be a single interest group because it's uh, it's focused on just one issue, which is the environment. Um, the uh, examples of uh, single issue groups are Right to Life, NARAL, which is the National Abortion Rights Action League, the NRA, of course, the big one here, the National Rifle Association, MAD is Mothers Against Dug, uh, Drunk Driving, Normal is the National Organization for the Relaxation of Marijuana Laws. Um, you know, none of these groups really want to uh, to compromise on their issues. Then we get the ideological groups. Now, these groups um, exist in order to uh, try to focus government on providing policies or engaging in policies that are in sync with the philosophical or moral stance of that organization. Now what we also have to fold into these ideological groups are think tanks which help these ideological groups come up with policy. So on the central center, center left you have the Brookings Institute, uh, center right you have the Manhattan Institute, the Heritage Foundation, Cato Institute. Um, uh, they're, all, they're all at work. They get funded by various organizations and various entrepreneurs and things like that. And they're, again, both on the left and the right, and they, they, uh, they are active. Um, they can also be active on the, on the religious front. You have the, uh, the Christian Moral Government Fund, which is to restore Christian values in America. You have the Americans for Democratic Action, which promotes liberalism. It, you know, they're all over the place. Uh, the ACLU is the long-standing long American Civil Liberties Union, the American Conservative Union. They're just <coughs> too many to too many to mention at this point. Now, the last group that we'll look at in this, thankfully for you guys, huh, a short lecture, we have a growing number of interest groups that represent government. Now, some of the, uh, some of the interest groups are, are foreign. They, foreign countries supplement their, uh, their political efforts, uh, which are made through their embassies with, um, by hiring uh, lobbyists in Washington DC to represent their interests. Uh, as well as I'll note later, um, the, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, lobbying firms uh, are on K Street in Washington. It's, it's kind of a uh, kind of a, a weird thing that you know we have Embassy Row in Washington and, but, and then we've got kind of like Lobby Row with, uh, with some of the big ones all on the same street. Um, What's, what's interesting is in, in this is that government lobbies government. And the states, the cities, the counties here in the United States lobby the federal government for
for money or for changes in policy. So these intergovernmental lobbies include, as you can see here, the Council of State Government, the National Governors Conference, the National Association of Counties, etc., etc. They represent the broad interests of cities, counties, water districts, you name it. Um, at the same time, these individual uh, member cities and states can lobby for their own particular interests outside of the organization. And the organizations themselves also represent the concerns of the bureaucracies at the local and at the state levels. So highway planners, um, highway engineers, county welfare directors, etc. Jobs within the bureaucracy are also represented by many of these organizations. So this is a big thing. And so our taxpaying dollars pay for our local and our, our county and our state governments to lobby the federal government for, for funding that will come back in order to, to work on infrastructure or social issues or whatever. So this is our look at, at the types of interest groups that exist. Um, we look at, uh, next we're going to look at the, the lobbying effort itself. You know, who, who are the lobbyists, what do they do, uh, what are the laws that govern them, so on and so forth. And um, we'll uh, look, at, look at that in four and then probably take on PACs in five.